Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and welcome to the Spring 2016 Chubbs Fellowship Lecture with our esteemed guest, the Honorable Norman Y. Mineta. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mary Liu. I'm a professor in the Departments of American Studies and History and the current head of Timothy Dwight College. As the master of the college, I have the honor of serving as the custodian of the illustrious Chubb Fellowship, established in 1941 out of a prior large donation for education purposes made in 1936 by Hendon Chubb from the class of 1895. Since establishment in 1941, the Chubb Fund has been used for the encouragement and aid of students interested in government and American public affairs. The fellowship initially aimed to foster an interest in public service, in local and state affairs, and then grew over the years to include numerous distinguished visitors in national and international affairs, as well as leaders in the world of the arts and humanities, from Wynton Marsalis to Nobel laureate Ansan Suu Kyi. And together, these incredible Chubb leaders have inspired generations of Yale students to undertake public service and pursue leadership roles in the hopes of creating a better world today and for posterity. Now with this quick description of the history and aims of the Chubb Fellowship, I'm now delighted to introduce our current Chubb Fellow, the Honorable Norman Y. Mineta. His long and illustrious career embodies all of the original aims of the Chubb Fellowship to recognize the importance of local and state leadership and also exemplifies the ways in which the Chubb Fellowship in these last few decades has expanded to bring in important national and world leaders to inspire our students on this campus. His career, spanning 50 years and counting, it's not over yet, certainly hits all of these notes and many, many more. Norman Yoshio Mineta was born in San Jose, California on November 12, 1931. Following the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and the signing of Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942, but just exactly 73 years ago this Friday, the Minetas, along with more than 120,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast, were forced from their homes and communities and relocated into camps operated by the newly established War Relocation Authority. The Minetas, along with their friends and neighbors, ended up at Santa Anita Racetrack and then moved onto Hart Mountain in Wyoming. In 1943, his father received WRA clearance to leave to teach Japanese language in a military training facility connected to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. The family would eventually be allowed to join him, and Norman Mineta would spend his middle school years attending school in Evanston. So maybe we can claim you as a Midwesterner. Following the war, the Minetas joined many West Coast Japanese Americans and returned home to rebuild their lives. Norman Mineta continued his education, graduating from San Jose High School and the University of California at Berkeley, where he participated in the Reserve Officers Training Program. He served as an intelligence officer with the US Army during the 1950s before joining his father's insurance business back in San Jose. Norman Mineta's path to public service began with his involvement in the local Japanese American community in San Jose. In 1962, he was appointed to the San Jose Human Relations Commission and then to the Municipal Housing Authority Board in 1966. He then served on the San Jose City Council. In 1971, he was elected mayor of San Jose, becoming the first Asian American to hold this office in a major American city. In 1974, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives for California's 13th District. His service to this district lasted for 21 years, where he either sponsored or co-sponsored 479 bills, including the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1991 and the Intermodal Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991. He also played a crucial leadership role in the landmark passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, working closely with Japanese American and Asian American community advocates and civil rights activists 
and lobbying fellow congressmen to redress the unjust incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. In 1994, he co-founded the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and served as the first chair. And after stepping down from his congressional seat, he took a brief vacation from public service. No, he didn't. <laughs> Not really. Uh, he assumed the position of vice president of Lockheed Martin Corporation and became the chairman of the National Civil Aviation Review Commission. During the second presidential term of President William J. Clinton, Norman Mineta, Mineta was called back into public service as a member of his cabinet, serving as the Secretary of Commerce. His appointment made him the first Asian American to serve on a presidential cabinet. And under George W. Bush, Norman Mineta became the Secretary of Transportation and oversaw the grounding of airplanes in U.S. airspace shortly after the third plane attack on the Pentagon. Under his term, he began the creation of the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, before its relocation to the Department of Homeland Security in 2003. If any of you have spent time in the San Jose area, probably more familiar to all of you as Silicon Valley, you can see still very much how much his service continues to be celebrated. You've probably landed in Norman Y. Mineta International Airport. You may have driven on California State Highway 85, also known as, uh, named, also named after Norman Y. Mineta. Um, as students who are in San, from San Jose tell me, you really cannot walk around and not notice Norman Y. Mineta's name on just about everything. In addition, San Jose, State, San Jose State University built the Norman Mineta Transportation Institute that supports design and policy innovations in sustainability and governance for local and national transportation infrastructures. He stepped down from his cabinet position in 2006 and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George W. Bush. In 2007, he received the Grand Cordon Order of the Rising Sun by the government of Japan. And in 2012, he received the Distinguished Medal of Honor for Lifetime Achievement and Public Service from the Japanese American National Museum. And now it is my extreme honor and pleasure and privilege that has accepted the Chubb Fellowship in 2016. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Norman Y. Mineta to the stage. Thank you very, <clears throat> very much for that warm and generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for that very warm welcome, despite the weather as it is outside. You cannot imagine how thrilled I am to be honored as the Chubb Fellow here at Yale University and Timothy Dwight College. Um, when, as I, when I was at San Jose High School graduating, my best friend came here to Yale University and I went to Berkeley. And pretty soon he wrote to me and said, well, I'm here at Timothy Dwight College. I wrote back to him, I said, Bruce, I thought you were at Yale. <laughs> yeah. Little did I know about the residential college program, and yet uh, about three years ago, a number of us, uh, having lived at a certain dormitory uh, at Berkeley, decided that we wanted to, to take it over in a public-private partnership and create a residential college program. So we raised some $47 million, and uh, last year we were able to get a 75-year lease from the University of California, and we are patterning the reconstruction and the operation of Bowles Hall at Berkeley after the residential college program 
of the Ivy League schools. We found a lot of resistance when we were doing this until uh, Nicholas Dirks from Columbia University, the provost, was became the, the chancellor at Berkeley. And when we took the idea to him, he immediately took the, the idea of creating the residential college program. And so this September, we will be uh, opening up Bowles Hall as a RSP, um, patterned after the residential college program of uh, the Ivy League schools. And uh, Chancellor Dirks has also indicated that he's going to be tearing down the 11 dor dormitories that we have at uh, Berkeley. He says they look like uh, Soviet style <laughs> Stalag, Stalag creations. So he wants to take those down and build them on a residential college program. But I am really thrilled because Bruce was my closest friend and unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Uh, was a resident here at uh, Timothy Dwight College. Then after graduating and then serving in the Navy, he came back and graduated from uh, the School of Law here at, at uh, Yale. But in any event, I am just um, thrilled to be here as the, the um, Chubb Fellow for 2016. First of all, I'd like to introduce my wife, Denny, who's here in front. Honey, you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to use um, a lot of this uh, presentation in, uh, as a personal experience that I encountered, even though this has been uh, the experience of many, many people of Japanese ancestry. My parents both uh, immigrated from Japan. My dad, in 1902, as a 14-year-older, came to the United States on his own. And I always think, would I ever have left, let my 14-year-old sons go off to a country where they don't know the language, they don't know anybody, and uh, to start life anew? But uh, my dad was a number two son, Everything goes to number one. So he figured, well, I might as well go and see what it's like in the United States. And as he said, he didn't know that much about US geography. Instead of getting off the ship in San Francisco, he got off the ship in Seattle. So he was 800, 900 miles away from where he should be. But he worked from one lumber camp, from farm camp to another <clears throat> to make his way all the way down to um, Salinas, where his uncle had started to work for Spreckles Sugar Company. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm just on the tail end of a cold. <coughs> so you'll have to excuse me if my uh, voice gives out every so often. <coughs> And I'm more sympathetic to the person who's handing the audio back here, listening to <laughs> my coughing through the mic. <clears throat> so his uncle said when he got to Salinas, you've got to learn English. <coughs> So he put him in the first grade. And he said it was the most humiliating thing he has ever done. <laughs> Not because he didn't know English, but he was five foot two. And the kids in that grammar school were getting up as tall as he was. So he said that became a very great incentive for him to learn English. <laughs> By the end of the second grade, he had decided he had learned enough English, so he graduated himself from the second grade. <laughs> uh, 
and then Sprinkle Sugar gave him a job. So um, he was very um, thankful for that. <clears throat> My mother came in 1914, and she was a picture bride. Because when my dad turned 24, he wrote to a friend and said, you know, it's time for me to get married. <coughs> but there are no Japanese women here. So the friend wrote, sent him a bunch of pictures and said, well, you know, here's Mary, Susie, Joanne. Um, <coughs> and he said, I'm also, <coughs> excuse me, including a picture of my sister. Remember when we used to tease her and kick her around when we were growing up? So my dad decided to marry his sister, but I haven't seen her for a number of years. So she was known as part of that group, known as Picture Brides. And they got married uh, in San Francisco in 1914. <clears throat> I know this is tougher on you than me, and I apologize. So let's fast forward <clears throat> to December 7, 1941. Now, as <clears throat> Mary indicated, I was born on November 12, 1931, and I chose very carefully the family that I was born into. <laughs> a great mother, great father, three great older sisters and a great older brother, and I was the youngest of five and uh, could not have had a better upbringing than in that family. But when December 7th occurred, and my dad was in the insurance business and well known in the Japanese community, and because he knew English, he sort of became the liaison between the Japanese community and the majority community in San Jose. And so, we had just returned home from church uh, past noon on that Sunday, turned on the radio, then heard all the news about what was happening in Hawaii. And people started calling the house, wondering, given what's happening in Hawaii, what's the impact going to be on us? And then about 1.32 o'clock, Joyce Hirano, our next door neighbor, comes running in through the back door yelling, the police are taking Papa away. The police are taking Papa away. So my dad runs out the front door, next door. But by the time he got there, Mr. Hirano was already gone. And he had no idea, and Mrs. Hirano, nor their son Irving, knew who came to the house. But Mr. Hirano was gone. So my dad came home, and he called the city manager of San Jose to ask what was going on. Mr. Goodwin says, I have no idea what you're talking about. So he said, but why don't you call Chief Black? So he called Chief of Police Black and said, what's going on? And Chief Black said, I, I don't know anything about what you're talking about, but why don't you talk to Sheriff Emig? So he talked to Sheriff Emig, and uh, Sheriff Emig said, well, it's not my operation, but I do know about it. It's the FBI conducting this uh, operation. And I'll have um, the FBI give you a call. So about 4.30 that afternoon, the FBI a special agent in charge of the San Jose office came to the house. And he explained that he, they were picking up people who were sympathetic to the Japanese and who were also community leaders. Well, my dad thought, of, thought I'm a community leader, uh, why am I not being picked up? And so he was a little insulted that he was not being looked at as a potential uh, person to be picked up. And in fact, after the FBI agent left, 
my mother and dad packed a suitcase just in case uh, they came back, which fortunately they did not. So uh, because of all this transpiring in, at Pearl Harbor, uh, people were really concerned about what was going to happen to them. And on the West Coast at that time, there was a Western Civil Defense Command that was um, headed up by a General uh, DeWitt. And um, so <clears throat> on February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, delegating to the commanding general of the Western Civil Defense Command the ability to evacuate persons. Didn't say Germans, didn't say Japanese, didn't say Italian, just said persons. General DeWitt never did like those of Japanese ancestry. And he used the phrase one time, once a JAP, always a JAP. And he figured if the Japanese were going to be able to attack Pearl Harbor, they would be able to attack the West Coast. And if they attack the West Coast, what do I do with the 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry from Washington, Oregon, and California? And so with Executive Order 9066 <clears throat> now in his hand, He then commandeered racetracks and county fairgrounds because they had built-in living quarters, namely horse tables. And so <clears throat> a number of fairgrounds in Washington, Oregon, and California, including racetracks <laughs> were taken over by uh, the Western Civil Defense Command. <laughs> and in order to notify us that we were going to be subject to evacuation, they had these big placards. They posted them on the side of buildings, utility poles. Attention all those of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. And as a 10-year-old kid, as I looked at that, I'm going, alien and non-alien? Who's a non-alien? So I asked my brother, I said, who's a non-alien? He said, that's you, a citizen. I said, well, why aren't they calling us citizens instead of non-aliens? But already the psychological warfare was being played on us. And that's why to this day, I cherish the word citizen because my own government wasn't willing to use it again on, on us. And we were considered non-aliens. <clears throat> and then in April of 1942, my brother, and he was then a sophomore at um, San Jose State College, and he and I shared a bedroom. And he's crying. I said, Al, what's the matter? He said, well, this is my draft card. 1A, fit and able to serve. But I got a new one yesterday, and it says 4C. So I just called the draft board today to find out what's a 4C, enemy alien. So here's a kid who was born and raised in San Jose, who all of a sudden has, were all young Japanese American males, of uh, draft age classified, reclassified as enemy aliens. So with all this kind of confusion and turmoil going and anxiety going on in the community, everyone was having to get rid of their personal and, and real properties um, <clears throat> because you could only take to camp what you could carry. And as I was saying to a group of students earlier, the, the toughest job I had was to part with my dog. And I love peanut butter, so my dog's name was Skippy. And a little terrier, 
but I had to get rid of him, and it was the toughest thing I think uh, I've done, or well, at least for a 10-year-old, it was a tough thing to do. So we could only pack to take to camp what we could carry. Now, my mother, as an example, always had a fetish about ironing things, whether it's sheets or anything else, but she couldn't take her iron because they, that was a contraband article. AM radios and all cameras were contraband articles. So we were only able to take to camp what we could carry. So on the day that we were leaving San Jose to board the trains to go off to camp, May 29th, 1942, we were boarding the train at the freight yard, not at the passenger depot, but at the freight yard. But for me, I, that wasn't too bad because the freight yard was five blocks from my grammar school and we were gonna leave at one o'clock and a lot of the kids during the lunch hour came down to, train, to the train to see their friends off. So to that extent, it was a plus. So we boarded the train and I was wearing a Cub Scout uniform, carrying a baseball, baseball glove and a bat. And as I was getting on the train, the um, MPs confiscated the bat on the basis it could be used as a lethal weapon. And so I went running, crying to my dad, and he said, no, no, that's all right, don't worry. We'll get a replacement for that bat. Well, we never did because there were no stores in Santa Anita at the camp. So it was a long time before I got my own bat back again. Now, because of this experience, now, and fortunately when we got to Santa Anita, we were one of the last groups coming into camp. So by that time, all the, all the uh, uh, stables were filled. But I used to go visit my friends in June and July, and you can just imagine what it's like in Southern California with that heat beating down on those stables. And I don't know how those folks lived in those stables given the stench. But in any event, we were fortunate enough to be able to be assigned to one of the barracks buildings that had been built in the uh, parking lot. So we were there until roughly the end of November of 1942. And in the meantime, they were building these more, quote, permanent, un unquote, camps in Arizona, Colorado, Arkansas, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and uh, Utah. And so the camp we went to from Santa Anita was Hart Mountain, Wyoming, which is about 20 miles east of Cody, Wyoming, which all of you know is about 50 miles east of Yellowstone National Park. So we were up there in that northwest part of, of uh, Wyoming. And the day we got there, the wind was blowing and, and all of us from California um, were just, couldn't get over how cold it was. Not only cold, but with that wind blowing and that sand just beating against your face, it, it just was something else. And uh, so we get to our barracks building and it's just filled with silt and no brooms or anything to use. So we had to use whatever we could find to use as a sort of a shovel to sift or get this sand off to the side. And um, schools hadn't been built yet. And the elders were wondering, gee, what do we do with the kids? So they had written to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts of America, said, please come to the camps and organize troops for us, which they did. So within our camp, we had maybe 10 or 12 uh, Boy Scout troops. And um, so we were having jamborees in the camp. And our scout leaders would write to the scouts in, in uh, Cody and Ralston and Deaver and some of those other communities that were surrounding the camp. And they'd say, come on in and join us for our jamboree. And they'd write back and say, no, no, 
We're not going in there. There's barbed wire around the camp. There are military guard towers with searchlights and machine gun mounts every 300 feet. There are POWs. We're not going in there. And they'd write back and say, no, no, no. These are not POWs. These are Boy Scouts of America. They wear the same uniform you do. They read the same manual you do. They go after the same merit badges you do. Finally, one of the troops from Boy, uh, Boy Scout troops from Cody, Wyoming came in. And so we had our knot tying contests. We had our woodworking contests. We had those how to start a fire without a mar match kind of contest. And after we went through all of that, we then got paired off with a kid from the Boy Scout troop in Cody to put up our tent. <clears throat> so this kid and I put up our tent. And Wyoming could rain any time, any amount. So you have to build a moat around the, the, the tent to protect it. So as we were digging our moat around the tent, the kid from the Cody troop said, there's a kid in my uh, troop in that tent below us. I don't really care for him. Would you mind if we cut the water to exit that way if it rains? <laughs> <coughs> it was really no skin off my nose. So I said, sure. And as luck would have it, it started raining later. And our moat worked perfectly. The water drained down that way. And during the course of the evening, tent pegs pulled and the tent came down. And the kids in the tent with me going, hee, ha, ha, just laughing all night long. And I finally said to him, Alan, would you please shut up so we get some sleep? His name was Alan Simpson. <laughs> Sound familiar? Became the US Senator from Wyoming in 1978. And the odd thing about it is that through junior high school, high school, and college, we wrote to each other. And then in 74, I got elected to the House, and he got elected to the Senate in 78. And even as conservative Republican he was, and as liberal Democrat as I was, we were the best of friends, and we are still to today. Um, so let's go to 9-11. I'm Secretary of Transportation, and I'm having breakfast that morning with the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium, who also serves as the Minister of Transport, and with uh, Jane Garvey, <clears throat> who was head of the FAA. And the three of us were having breakfast talking about aviation issues uh, before the European Union. And my chief of staff came in and said, Mr. Secretary, may I see you? So I excused myself and went into my office. And as I went into my office, at the other end of the TV council, there were the Twin Towers, black smoke billowing out of one of them. I said, John, what's that? He said, we don't know. We've heard the possibility of general aviation aircraft, commercial aircraft, and even the possibility of an explosion within the building. So I watched the TV for a little while <clears throat> and um, then said, I've got to go in to the meeting. So I went back in and explained to Anne and I mean to Jane and to uh, Mrs. Durant what I had just seen. And six, seven minutes later, John came back in, may I see you? So I excused myself, went back into my office. He said, it's been confirmed it was a commercial airliner that went into the building. So as I was coming up to the TV, looking at it, all of a sudden one, I see this gray object going across the screen. And then on the left side of the screen, it disappears, and this white, yellow, orangey, billowy cloud appears on the left side of the screen. And I go, holy cow, what was that? Or words to that effect. And um, so then I really started to listen and look at the TV screen. 
And uh, so after about seven, eight minutes of this, I said, John, I've got to go back in, get myself out of this breakfast meeting. So I went in and explained to Jane Garvey and Mrs. Durand what I had just seen on the television set. I said, I don't know what's going on up in New York, but it's something I'm going to have to deal with. Jane, you've got to get back to the FAA <clears throat> operations center. And so by the time I got back into my office, the White House called and said, get over here right away. So I grabbed some papers and threw them in my briefcase and went downstairs to the car. And as we're going in West Executive Drive at the White House, people are running out of the executive office building. They're running out of the White House. And I said to my driver and security guy, is there something wrong with this picture? We're driving in and everybody else is running away. So get out of the car, went into the White House. And the guard said, you have to be briefed by Mr. Clark in the Situation Room. So I went into the Situation Room and Dick uh, briefed me. He wouldn't, really didn't tell me much more than what I already had heard on uh, television. And then he said, you've got to be in the PIOC. I said, the PIOC? What's the PIOC? P-O-C, Presidential Emergency Operations Center. And I said, I have no idea where that is. And there was a Secret Service agent standing there. So he said, I'll take you down. Well, this is that bunker that's way under the White House and it's supposed to be nuclear bomb proof, I guess. But in any event, I went down there and uh, the vice president was already down there. And there's a table probably about 30, 40 feet long, about 15 feet wide, with chairs all the way around. And between each of the chairs are telephones. So I took one set of phones, what one phone, and set it up to my office at the Department of Transportation, and the other one to the FAA, and uh, <clears throat> sat there uh, in the PIOC the, the whole the rest of the day. A military aide came into the vice president who was sitting across from me. I said, there's a plane coming towards DC. So I said to Monty Belger, the number two at FAA, I said, uh, Monty, I understand there's a plane coming towards DC. <clears throat> you know where it is and what, what, what's the plane? He said, well, we've been tracking this plane, but the transponder's been turned off. So all we're doing is watching the white little target on every 11 second uh, swing of the radar. So <clears throat> I said, uh, looking at radar, can you relate it to where it's on the ground? And which is difficult to do. He said, no, it's somewhere in the middle of, Arca uh, of uh, Pennsylvania. So every so often I'd be asking, where's the plane? And so he would sort of guess as to where he thought the airplane was. Well, on my credenza behind my desk, <clears throat> I had a monitor outline of the 48 states, Hawaii and Alaska, just peppered with dots. Well, if I took my mouse and put it on a dot, all of a sudden there'd be a, a flag that would come up and it would say UA-123. <coughs> United Airlines, one, flight 123. And then it would say PDX and a number of navigational points and an ORD. So when you left Portland, this is the route it's gonna be flying, lands at O'Hare uh, Field in Chicago. And then the next line it would say B, 752, Boeing 757, 200 series. Then we give me the com compass direction of the plane. Speed, tell me about the, how much fuel <coughs> in the plane. Tell me a lot about the airplane. And that was the transponder that was turned off. So every so often I'd ask, where is it? I said, well, I think it's north of Baltimore. 
<clears throat> Where is it now? <coughs> Probably near the Great Falls, um, Rosalind and Rave. <coughs> Where is it now? Oh, probably near uh, Pentagon City going towards National Airport. Where is it now? Oops. Oops. Oops, what? We just lost the target target. We just lost the target. We just lost the bogey. Where'd you lose it? Somewhere between the uh, <clears throat> Pentagon City National Airport. <laughs> and then about that time, someone broke into the phone and said, Mr. Secretary, we just got a call from an Arlington County officer who saw an American Airlines go into the Pentagon. Well, Al-Qaeda used to always talk about three icons, military icon, political icon, economic icon. And obviously that day, they hit the economic icon, the World Trade Center. Uh, and then they hit the military icon, the Pentagon. And I said to Monty, I said, Monty, when you see one of something happen, especially when you see three commercial airliners being used as missiles, and I said, once you've seen one of something, it's an accident. But if you see a second of the same thing, it's a pattern or a trend. But when you see three of the same thing in a relatively short period, it's a plan or an action. And I said, in the military, they have something called a stand down. And we've got to do our own stand down. We've got to bring all the planes down. And he said, we'll bring all the planes down per pilot discretion. And I said, mine, screw pilot discretion. I want the, all the planes down, because I didn't want someone over Albuquerque or Phoenix go flying into Los Angeles. I wanted those planes down as soon as possible. And at that point, we had 5,368 airplanes in the air, and in two hours and 20 minutes, we had them all down on the ground safely and without incident. And that morning, I also pulled three people out of ACS, Aviation Civil Security of the FAA. Started having them work on a new security regimen because Tuesday afternoon, the CEOs of the airlines were calling up saying, when are we gonna be able to fly? And I said to them, you're not gonna be able to fly until we establish a new security regimen. So as the folks were working on that security regimen on Thursday, there was a cabinet meeting of the cabinet with the members of the House and Senate, Democratic and Republican leadership. And towards the end of that meeting, Congressman David Bonnier from Detroit, Michigan said, Mr. President, we have a very large Arab American population living in, in Michigan. And they're very concerned about all the rhetoric they're hearing about banning Middle Easterners from flying, keeping Muslims off airplanes, uh, on and on and on. And uh, the president said, David, you're absolutely right. We are equally concerned about all that rhetoric. And we don't want to have happen today what happened to Norm in 1942. And so when I got back from the meeting and asked how our security regiment coming along, they said the first one right at the top was no racial or ethnic profiling. And uh, so we were able to pound out the rest of it by late Friday afternoon and issue that in the form of a regulation. But it, again, it, is a, it was a time in which there was a great deal of concern about security and about how to deal with uh, an ethnic or racial minority. 
and including a, a religious group. And then towards the end of September in Arizona, there was a shooting and killing of a person who owned a gas station and a mini mart. And when they apprehended the killer, they asked him, why did you shoot and kill this guy? And he said simply, because he looked like the enemy. And this fellow happened to be a Sikh with his uh, head gear, facial hair, bind leg bindings, and uh, other than simple explanation, because he looked like the enemy. Uh, on Monday, the I guess that would be the 17th of September, the president gathered a, number, a large number of Arab Americans and Muslims at the Islamic Study Center in uh, Washington, D.C. And he said, we know who did that last Tuesday. They were not loyal Arab Americans. They were not uh, faithful followers of Islam. Uh, they were terrorists, and we're going to go after them. Similarly, with the killing of this Sikh, he had a very large group of South Asian Indian Americans come to the White House in October, and he told them that we are not going to allow this kind of hate crime to occur, and we will pursue uh, whoever does these things until they're brought to justice. So all of this, again, sort of relates to this December 7th in terms of security and the need for weighing civil liberties, then 9-11, and then now today with ISIS or ISIL. And all of us have to be very vigilant in the protection of our constitutional rights. We don't have to be vigilantes about it, but we have to be very vigilant about our constitutional rights. And at the same time, I know there's a security concern that has to be attended to. And I think in a democratic society of ours, that's something that all of us are able to do in an open and free discussion. But it's something that bothers me because in, the, in this discussion of the political presidential election run up to 2016, uh, some things are being said that, that uh, really bother me and sort of make me think back to December 7, 1941 or 9-11, 2001, or the present circumstance, including I, ISIS and uh, ISIL. So it's something that all of us have to deal with. And to the young people in the audience, I want you to pursue your career and professional goals. But as you do so, think about taking some time to offer yourself as a subject matter expert to your mayor, your county executive, governor, or president. Because as you pursue your professional goal, I want you to also think about what you can do to lend your subject matter expertise to public policy and help in that way. Not everybody has to run for office. In a democratic society, you have everyone from a well-read citizen to the person who runs for office. But the one who runs for office may be 1% or 2% of the population. So you may not be in that group that wants to run, but you want to do something public service. And that's where you can still pursue your own career goals and yet volunteer to be a member of a board or a commission to whatever level of government that you would like to, to, uh, to lend yourself to. So um, with that, let me stop and maybe take up some questions and answers, Mary, if that's all right. Okay, thank you very much.
So I think this is on. Yes, this is on. Okay, so now um, we are going to open it up for questions and answers. I believe when you all walked in, you should have received a card. So please do write down um, questions that you have for Secretary Mineta. And we do have aides who should be coming up and down the, the aisles to collect um, your questions. So while that's happening, um, I do have a couple of quick questions to start us off. Okay. The first one is, um, I was very struck by the story that you told, and especially in terms of the aftermath of 9-11 and, and thinking uh, in the response by President Bush at the time saying absolutely no racial or ethnic profiling as, as just as important as um, the security of the American people. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about how that sentiment and that goal and vision was also part of the creation of the TSA under, under your leadership. Next question. <clears throat> <laughs> well, right after uh, we had come into office, uh, President Bush had invited uh, my wife and me to Camp David. And um, so after dinner one night, we had a just sort of a, you know, talk around the table, and I did explain or talk about, because he did ask, well, tell me about the evacuation internment. And we spent quite a bit of time about the evacuation and internment. And this would have been in probably about March of uh, 2001. And um, so the whole idea of grounding the planes Really, um, I suppose if I had had to th think about it, I don't know what I would have had, what I would have done on 9/11, but I know I was comfortable in having to order the, all the planes down. Now, the formation of the Transportation Security Administration came because in the old system, the airlines were in charge of the. Uh, inspection of passengers onto airplanes and they would contract with independent companies to do this at all their airports and of course those are always done on the lowest bid and given to the cheapest contractor that submitted a bid and uh, so obviously 9-11 said to us there were a lot of flaws in uh, the system so we put together our own legislation and the center of it was that these um, inspectors uh, were going to be government employees. And that became a very major arm wrestle um, between our department and the Congress as we were having the Transportation Security Administration Act make its way through the House and Senate because many wanted to just keep going with private contractors. But I felt that in order to have the same standard, whether you were in New York or Resume Speed, Iowa, or wherever, to, that it had to really be uh, a government employee. And we prevailed on that count. Now, we did include a provision in that original bill that allowed up to five communities to have outside contractors do the work. And we based it on large uh, hub carrier, uh, small uh, non-point uh, carrier, and we had various varieties, but we did allow five airports to have non-government contract employees. But they have to allow, they have to uh, have the same system as all the other government owned uh, or government operated uh, security systems. <clears throat> Does that answer that, uh, yeah. Mary? So we have a lot of questions, and, and I do apologize if we don't actually get to your question. I'm going to do the best I can. Um, one question is, can you talk about serving as a Democrat in a Republican administration's cabinet? Considering the political uh, divisiveness in the country today, 
Is this some, is this, uh, what, what advice might you have to offer on, war, on the partisan divides? Well, <clears throat> this is really a difficult question because today it is the, the way things operate in DC, totally different from when, what they were even as recently as 15 years ago. Today, well, let me go back to when I was in the Congress, Tip O'Neill required us to be there at 12 noon on Monday for the first vote and then stay until the last vote on Friday at 3 p.m. Today, the first vote is on Tuesday at 6.30. So members come in late Tuesday afternoon for a vote on, for their 6.30 vote on Tuesday. And then they're on, they're on Wednesday. And the last vote is at three o'clock on Thursday, if they have a vote. Now in probably 80, probably 90% of the days or 90% of the Thursdays, they haven't had votes on Thursday. So they all leave early Thursday morning go home to their home districts. They don't know each other. They don't know even the subject matter of the committees they're assigned to. And I still deal with many of the members. And it's appalling to me that they don't know the subject matter of the committees they're assigned to. On the other hand, running campaigns is so much more expensive today than it was some time back. So they're all dialing for dollars all the time. Now, in my first race in 1974, between the primary and the general election, I spent $247,000. In my last race in 1994, I raised 1.3 million, spent 700,000. Today, there isn't a race that is under two to two and a half million dollars. And so they're having to raise that money all the time. But what's, what's even worse is the fact that they're not in DC. They're not dealing with their subject matters. They don't know each other. We used to uh, have fights in subcommittee, full committee on the floor, yet slap each other on the back, say, come on, let's go have dinner. Let's go have a uh, drink. And that doesn't occur today. There may be some isolated examples of that happening. And so it makes it very difficult. And on top of that, the members themselves are much more polarized uh, today. And I think that part of it is if you don't know somebody, you, can, you tend to be a little harsher on them. And I think that's what happens, is what's happening today. And uh, there isn't that personal relationship that existed. Uh, and as conservative as Alan Simpson was, and as liberal as I was, we'd still be able to have dinner, talk to each other about issues going on. And that really doesn't happen today. Now there's a group of bipartisan members of Congress or former members who are trying to work on trying to get this corrected right now. I think a, a sort of a follow-up question almost, not exactly, but what was the most significant difference between President Clinton and President Bush? I'm not sure you can really answer that, but I can't resist to ask. I mean, I do say, I, I do have a real card here. <laughs> Well, uh, um, President Bush was a CEO type of person where he, we as cabinet members, I remember when I spoke to him on, was that January 2nd, I guess it was, when we went down to Austin to meet him for the first time. And I had three things in mind. I want to talk to him about budget, policy and personnel. 
So when I talked to my budget, he says, no, 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 he says, so you're gonna have to arm wrestle with everybody else at OMB for your budget requirements. Then he said, on policy and personnel, I'm bringing you on as a subject matter expert. So I want you to give to me what your policy advice is, but I just don't want you hiring only Democrats at the Department of Transportation. And I said, no, no, I'll be using the presidential personnel office to recruit and bring people in. Uh, so the president really was a, a delegator. He, um, he expected me to do my job. He wasn't overseeing uh, what I was doing or saying, although we had to clear the speeches. But there was very little rewritten. President Clinton, uh, Oh, and then I like cabinet meetings. We'd have cabinet meetings every month. And if it was, if it was announced to start at 10 o'clock, you knew and right at the end, top of the hour, the meeting was gonna start. And there was always an agenda and always followed a certain pattern. Now, in the case of uh, President Clinton, I came in as Secretary of Commerce in June of uh, 2000. Bill Daly was the Secretary of Commerce, and he was leaving to go run the Gore campaign. And I was uh, Senior Vice President at um, Lockheed Martin. Six o'clock, I would packed up my briefcase, and I was about to leave, and the phone rang. Should I answer that phone or let it go? Should I answer the phone <laughs> or let it go? So I finally picked up the phone. It was John Podesta, the chief of staff for President Clinton calling. He says, Norm, he says, Bill Daly's leaving commerce. The boss has given me a, a short list of names to find out if these people would be interested in becoming secretary of uh, commerce. Would you be interested? And I said, John, do you want me to crawl through the telephone wire right now to your office <laughs> to, to give you my answer? Oh, he said, okay, okay, I'll put you down for yes. <laughs> and then on Thursday morning, President Clinton called up. He says, Norm, I'm sending your name up to the Senate this morning, uh, nominating you for Secretary of Commerce. So those were the two interviews, two phone interviews I had <clears throat> for Secretary of Commerce. Within about a week to 10 days, <coughs> I had been confirmed by the Senate. Now, they had a, a um, CAD meeting in June, but the one before that was March. And so, and then we had one in July, and it was supposed to start at 10, President didn't come in until about 10.45, and it went until about 12.30. With President Bush, you knew it was gonna start at a certain time, and it would last one hour. We had only two meetings that went beyond two hour, one hour. On the 13th of September, after 9-11, and then in April of, of um, 05, when they were talking about the ramp up in the Middle East. And uh, so that meeting went over an hour. And there was a televised closed circuit uh, program with our US ambassador in, uh, in Afghanistan and with uh, the commanding general, can't recall his name, who was in uh, uh, Qatar. So we had a three-way cabinet meeting, cabinet room, uh, Kabul, and uh, uh, Qatar. And that one went over an hour. 
the only time we had a meeting over an hour. But in the case of President Clinton, it would be a freewheeling conversation. <laughs> and it could go on for an hour and a half. And um, so, but it was, there were, there were just two different approaches. And, uh, and I, I really felt that the cabinet meeting under President Bush was a vehicle for him to have a press conference. Because <clears throat> we, I mean, we would not, uh, if you were the Secretary of uh, Defense and you brought something up, all of us around the table would not offer suggestions or advice or anything. And uh, so uh, it was a vastly different approach. So I, I do have a few questions um, as follow-up to your stories about the internment camp experience. Um, so I'm gonna ask a few of these. First one is, how has your experience as an interned Japanese American informed your political views and career in politics? <clears throat> it has, um, in terms of my own service as a city councilman, as mayor, as a member of Congress, uh, one of the things I've always kept in sight was to be able to speak for those who are not represented or who are underrepresented. And um, so I always felt that there were groups that were always uh, not represented in, in the actions of the government. And um, so when the whole idea of uh, the um, ADA, the Americans for with uh, Disabilities Act came up uh, with the National Council on Dis Disabilities. I wrote the whole transportation portion of the ADA. Um, but you know, having been interned doesn't become the the driving wedge, but is the backstop that keeps pushing me in terms of making sure that people's, that their issues are not disregarded or not dealt with. And so when I became mayor, um, just as I had been appointed to the city council in 1967, the Asian American population in San Jose at that time was probably two and a half, three percent. The Hispanic population was about 18 percent. So when I became mayor, that left, I left a vacancy on the city council. So I said to the Hispanic community, get together and come up with some names for me to consider to be appointed to the city council. And so I was able to appoint the first uh, Mexican American to, uh, to the city council in San Jose. But I've always tried to not use the evacuation and internment as the driving wedge, but as a backstop to really make sure I did my job. Another question uh, was, what was the attitude of your friends in the camp towards serving in the US military? And I think there's another question that another audience member asked, which is quite similar, just in particular um, asking about the responses of your older brother to the uh, loyalty questionnaire that was issued during the camp years. Okay, the loyalty questionnaire was something that was given to all the draft age males. And um, the, um, <clears throat> there were a number of questions and it came down to, I think it was question number 27, was would you forswear allegiance to the emperor of Japan and swear allegiance to the United States of America? And there were a lot of people who said, I've never sworn allegiance 
to the Emperor of Japan, so why should I have to sign a document that says I'm going to forswear my allegiance or, to the Emperor of Japan? And then the 20, question 28 was, uh, would you serve in the uh, military forces, armed forces of the United States? And a lot of them says, you know, you, having evacuated and turned me from my own home state, no, I'm not going to serve. So many people answered no on 27 and no on 28, and they became known as the no-no boys. And uh, there were, I believe, something like 63 from Heart Mountain, Wyoming, who were convicted uh, of uh, violating federal law and served um, maybe at least, I'd be guessing, but some two to three years at McNeil Island in uh, Washington, the state of Washington. And so there was that loyalty questionnaire that was circulated <clears throat> to uh, the uh, people, the males, and uh, that created a, a stir within the community because the uh, because of the 4C uh, draft classification, and they lifted that in the spring of or the latter part of 1943. Um, and as a result of that, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team was formed, which was an all Japanese American military unit serving in Europe. And when they asked for volunteers, and I believe they were looking for some 4,000, they had something like 7,000 volunteers from the camps to the army. And I used to always wonder whether or not the food in the camp was that much worse <laughs> than what they might experience in the army. Mm -hmm. But in any event, uh, and the 442nd ended up and still is uh, the most highly decorated unit in uh, US Army military history. And uh, for a regimental combat team, which is roughly 4,000 people, uh, they had, I believe, 23 medals of honor that were awarded during World War II to them. So, uh, and in fact, President Truman, in receiving uh, the 442nd back to the United States after World War II, um, had, a, uh, had a parade of the 442nd, and as he uh, put on the presidential unit citation on their uh, on their flag, he uh, mentioned that <clears throat> that the uh, soldiers had uh, beaten two enemies, one in the field, and the other prejudice at home. So, uh, and I credit. Uh, 442nd in their action that enabled a lot of us to be able to pursue uh, public service because of their record uh, in the military. So I, another follow-up question to that is, um, did you harbor resentment toward the U.S. government at all for interning you and your family? If so, how did you overcome that to eventually serve at the level of public service that you did? Well, I think the amazing thing about, <clears throat> about this whole story is that 120,000 people went through this experience and didn't come out with rancor or bitterness. Sure, there are some who harbored that rancor and bitterness, but I think the more, um, more clarion call uh, was that most people said, this should never ever happen to anyone else again. And I think by and large, 
uh, the Japanese American community has been very, very strong about making sure that something like this never ever happens again. <clears throat> I never <clears throat> went through any kind of feeling of bitterness or uh, remorse about what happened. And, um, and I don't think most people who had uh, experienced the, the um, internment evacuations did so, but they came out with a very strong feeling that something like this should never, ever happen again. And that's why I've worked on, uh, with a lot of people, the um, HR 442, which was the Civil Liberties Act of 1982 that was signed into law by President uh, Reagan. And this called for an apology by the Congress to the Japanese American population and uh, a redress amount that was awarded to those who uh, experienced redress, or uh, evacuation and internment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Along those lines, in terms of the current day political situation, um, as we've seen in the media today, um, there are constant references towards Japanese American internment as a way of dealing with the current refugee crisis. Um, what can you say more about your response to that? Uh, first of all, um, there should be a very strong response to anyone who tries to use Executive Order 9066 or the experience of the internment of Japanese Americans to apply to anyone today. I mean, to me, I, I just don't understand how someone be, could be calling for the deportation of all illegal immigrants and their families when their families are American citizens. I mean, the children of these people who have immigrated, uh, I don't know how they just summarily uh, deport them. They're US citizens, and that ought not to be part of the picture. Um, and uh, so uh, now I feel very strongly that people should not be using the evacuation and internment as a way of, of uh, taking care of the illegals right now. I mean, they've already interned women and children who have come across the border. And uh, <clears throat> again, I just don't think that's the way to, to solve the problem. So I think we have time for the one last question, and this is an appropriate one. I think I actually got through the stack. Um, so in your experience, what are the three most essential traits of leadership being a leader? <clears throat> well, the first one is something that, there are two things that all of us own, and we should not give that up in any way. One is our name, and the second is our integrity. And no matter what the circumstance might be, um, we ought not to compromise our own principles and ideals just for some short-term gain or even long-term gain. It just, to me, the whole name of the game is integrity. And uh, uh, it just makes me sick when I hear about people who couch their answers to whatever the question might be. Um, and, uh, but the other thing that just to me, um, there's so much, um, well, I don't know, necessarily 
corruption, but there is just too much uh, people not buying, standing by their by their own principles. And uh, so, in a way, I'd say one is integrity, two is integrity, three is integrity. <laughs> but but there are leadership traits that that uh, people I think should have. And today, when I hear people saying, well, I'm not a politician, well, then why are you running for public office? <laughs> um, you wouldn't go to a brain surgeon who says, I'm really not a brain surgeon. I'm, <laughs> I just practice every day at it. Uh, and um, to me, um, regardless of what profession or background we are in, we want to deal with subject matter experts, people who know what they're talking about, people who devote their time to the study of what it is they're, they're doing. And um, I just don't see that in a lot of instances today. So uh, in any event, um, uh, the integrity is still, no matter how I look at it, still number one.